Good morning, Wellspring family. It's good to be with you here in person or whether you're listening online. Did you know that according to the website wordfinders.com, there are 4,443 words that begin with the letters R E? Re words. That's a lot of R-E words. That is really a lot of R-E words. Get it? You might say it's a remarkable, relentless repository of re words. You can't quite say that's a ridiculous amount, though, because ridiculous starts with R-I. So, technically. But that's regrettable. And since this is the last series in our uh, the, lo- the last message in our sermon series called Rework. I hope you will humor me as I try to squeeze in every last reword that we can before this series ends. And I will try not to be redundant or repetitive if I can. And I can hear what you, some of you are thinking, Pastor Dan, that is just not going to work. And you're probably right. But think for a minute, just imagine... If there were no re-words, and we didn't have any of those 4,443 words, and we had to talk about God, and we had to talk about church and scripture and the way God's love moves and works, we wouldn't be able to say resurrection. We wouldn't be able to talk about receiving the Holy Spirit, or even reflecting on where we see God working in the world. It would be a very different world without re-words. And even though uh, my book, which was mentioned earlier, does not have any re-words in the title, I think I would probably lose about half of my content because if you know the book, there's four main themes and two of them start with re, repentance and renewal. So we'd all be up a creek without without re-words. Where or where would we be? And the other day I was pondering, thinking about, thinking about this writing process, and re- being reminded that this little book, which looks bigger on the screen, but it's an eight and a half by, uh, I think, five and a half inch stack of paper here. This was kind of like my baby for several years. And six months ago it was born in mid to late November 2021. So if it was a baby, it would be... Uh, hopefully sleeping through the night by now, I'm not sure, but it's really just paper, so I don't have to worry as much as if it were an actual baby. We've had those too. Um, But one of the things that has um, come up in these six months is conversations with folks about it, which have been fruitful, and learning that there are at least four typos in the book, which um, if you're keeping track... They are on pages 27, 43, 63, and 154. But most of all, I am just done. I'm just glad to be done with revising, rereading, and reworking draft after draft, reorganizing the chapters. It's a nice feeling to be six months in to the life of this book, which is no longer uh, dependent on me. It's out in the world. And without all of you as Wellspring, this little book with the tea green cover would not exist either because it was your prayers and your support and your encouragement that were indispensable going back to 2018, 2019, when it was still just a possible proposal that I was working up the courage to send in to InterVarsity Press, hoping that they would give it the green light possibly, or the the tea green colored light as it ended up being. So thank you, Wellspring, for that. Today's message, I'll see if my clicker works, is called A Time to Revision. Thankfully, it's not a time for revisions of my book, because that is done. So we're not talking about book revisions. That time has come and gone. And I have released the book in more ways than one. But it's actually a good thing that human beings are not like books. Because we can still be changed. It's not too late for revisions. We are continual works in progress. And our author, 
God, Keakua, continues to re- remake us, renew us, rework us, and there is still time to respond to whatever God is inviting us to do in how we see the world or hear the world. Now, to our scripture text today, we are going to dump we are going to jump right in to the story of Queen Esther. And Queen Esther is someone who is pulled into a national crisis beyond her control. And there are innocent lives that hang in the balance. There are vulnerable children, you might say school-aged children, who are caught in the crosshairs of the social, political turmoil of their day. And Esther's people, the Jews, were at risk of being executed by the state, potentially wiped out like a holocaust because of a man named Haman, who we read about in the book of Esther. He's a court official in the Persian Empire, right under the king, basically like a prime minister in his function under King Xerxes. And what happened was, Haman used his position of power to force all the royal workers at the king's gate to kneel before him and bow before him face down. And he was even able to get this policy approved and rubber stamped by the king, which made it the law of the land. The law of the land, an unjust law, except there was one problem. And his name was Mordecai. Mordecai, as we read, was Esther's uncle. He was a devout Jewish man who refused to kneel and bow down to Haman. And so Haman retaliates by coming up with a scheme to eliminate not just Mordecai, but all of Mordecai's people throughout the kingdom. And so again, he goes to King Xerxes and persuades the king that these Jews can't be tolerated and they must be slaughtered. And the king, being a man of great moral fiber and conviction, tells Haman, okay, sure, do whatever you want with them. And so Haman has free reign to do what he wants. He puts a date on the calendar where it's going to take place. Every Jew will be killed, young and old, male and female, the whole nation of God's people. But then there's Mordecai who learns about this. And when he learns the news, he puts on sackcloth and ashes, symbols of mourning, symbols of lament. We've done some lament this morning already. And he goes to the public square and wails so loudly that people are wondering what the commotion is. And the word gets back to Queen Esther that her uncle is doing this publicly mourning. And that's when something starts to change in Esther. She starts to revision, in a sense. And up until this point, it's important to remember that she had kept her Jewish identity hidden in order to blend in, in order to assimilate and survive within the dominant culture. Back in Esther chapter 2, we read about how when she was selected as queen, it was a whole process where the previous queen, Queen Vashti, was removed because she said no to the king's demands that she be paraded around in front of his drunken guests one night. And in a drunken rage, the king retaliated and made an example out of her to send a message to what happens in this patriarchal society to women who don't know their place. He made an example out of Vashti. And so that's the context where Esther comes in as a replacement. And it's dangerous for her. She keeps her Jewish identity secret, just like her uncle Mordecai taught her to do. And so her selection process as a queen, sometimes it gets referred to as a beauty pageant, but it's actually something that cannot be mistaken for romance. This was not dating. This was not courtship. This probably doesn't even qualify as an arranged marriage because Esther's family doesn't have much choice in the matter. And to call it a beauty To call it a beauty pageant would make it sound 
too much in our minds, I believe, like a Miss Universe or the Bachelor TV show or something like that. When in reality, this was far from consensual. And so basically the king takes advantage of his throne. He sends out his subordinates to find as many beautiful virgins as they can, brings them all in a group to the king's harem. And all these women are together, Esther included, and slowly she begins to move up the ranks to the point where she becomes the king's favorite concubine, basically. And throughout this ordeal, Esther is doing what she has to do to survive in dominant culture, just like her uncle Mordecai taught her. She did not disclose her ethnicity. She did not disclose her family background. She certainly did not tell anyone her Hebrew name, which we read in chapter 2 was Hadassah. We also learn that her parents died somehow. The text doesn't say. But because both of her parents were gone, she went under the care of her uncle Mordecai, who became like a father to her. And she was like a daughter to him. And like any protective father who wants to shield their daughter from prejudice or mistreatment in an anti-Semitic society, Mordecai helps Esther to conceal her identity. And so Hadassah becomes Esther. Even after she's crowned queen, the king throws this lavish feast for her and she's won the contest. She still doesn't tell anyone about her background or race. And yet something changes when she hears the laments and the wails of her father in the streets. Something changes as she starts to revision her place and position. And she starts to think that maybe she cannot keep her secret forever. And so we pick up the story in chapter 4. There was a lot of background, but it's important. And in chapter 4, Esther and Mordecai are communicating with each other but not directly. They have messages going back and forth because she's up in the palace and he's outside the city gate. And so Mordecai sends Esther a message asking her to go directly to the king and to seek help for their people. And Esther, still in the process of figuring out if she wants to reveal who she is and why she would make such a request, she kind of tells Mordecai to tone it down and change his clothes and not be so dramatic with the sackcloth and ashes. And she also reminds Mordecai just how risky that is in this current setup of a system where unless you have an invitation to go to see the king, doesn't matter if you're the queen or the favorite concubine, you can't just go and see the king uninvited because the penalty for that is death unless he reaches out his gold scepter and spares your life. And that's the first time in this interaction between Mordecai and Esther, that's the first time in the whole book of Esther that we actually hear Esther's voice for the first time. It takes us all the way until chapter four. But finally, we hear a little bit of what she's thinking. And then Mordecai replies in verse 12, which is where we pick up the story. It's on the screen and it's also in your bulletin if you want to follow along. Starting in Esther 4, Verse 12 to 14. So, Esther replies to Mordecai, that's really risky, uncle. And when Esther's words were reported to him, Mordecai sends back this answer. Do you not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? For if you remain silent at this, t- at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will still perish. And who knows, Mordecai says, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Hadassah, now Esther, you're in a royal position now. And who knows, it might be for such a time as this. Let's take a a closer look real quick at verse 14, where Mordecai says this to Esther. Notice how he says, your royal position. Think about Esther's royal position. It was royal, but also vulnerable. 
She's not a peasant anymore. She's not the, you know, just another concubine anymore. She's not in her, you know, father's house where she's protect, protected under Mordecai's wing anymore. On the inside, she still knows that she's Jewish. That's her people. That's her heritage. She knows her birth name of Hadassah. And yet, she's also been formed multiculturally to become someone who speaks both the Hebrew language of her people as well as the dominant language of the Persian Empire. So she's intelligent. She has some integrity. And she's physically beautiful. But her position has changed when she became the queen. And because she's a queen, even in a man's world, she has, she has some access to the king in a way that others do not. Now remember, the previous queen, Vashti, had been thrown off, uh, taken off the throne because the king lost his temper. And so Esther is aware of this. She's aware that this could be a very temporary throne and crown like her predecessor. And yet she also knows that when Vashti said, no, king, I will not be paraded around this particular drunken party, there's something about that that I think resonated with Esther as well that gave her permission to say, you know what? If I need to, I can say what I believe. If I need to, I can raise my voice. She's in a tough spot still, but she's starting to revision things and get in touch with her own agency, her influence, her resources. She's in the palace for crying out loud. And that brings us to number one in your outline as we think about our process to partner with God's purposes, to activate your revisioning process and partner with God's purposes. Ask, what is my quote-unquote royal position? Where do I have influence? Where do I have resources? You may not live in a palace, but you might have American citizenship. You might not have a crown on your head, but you might be in the middle class with some disposable income. You might have some social networks. You might have graduated from a good school. You have a voice. And so what is your position for such a time as this? I love that it's graduation Sunday for this, by the way. It's awesome. And it's awesome to see Rachel and Alex serving with the live stream team. It's just wonderful, the view I have. I think I'm the only one right now with this view, but it's really great. What is your position? Last week, Pastor Cheryl spoke about taking an uh, awareness checkup, a checkup list of our awareness. And so to apply that to this situation, how aware are you of your current position and resources and influence? Are you aware that your voice matters? You might have more agency than you realize. We often think about what we don't have, right? Well, I'm not like that person. I don't have that kind of platform. But then again, what do you have? You might have more potential to make a difference for what God wants to do in the world than you think. You might have more capacity than you did before. Maybe because of your degree, maybe because of the wisdom that you have, maybe you're in a different season financially. Whatever it is, you might have more power than you realize to use for good, like Esther had that position. And especially, you might have more than you realize when you join with others who share common priorities and values and care about those same things that matter to you. When you join up with them, that's when we can really underestimate what's possible. Like many of you, this past week, I heard the news on Tuesday about this mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. And I did not know what to think, what to say, what to do at first. Part of me thought, here we go again. I've seen this before. Another part of me said, well, uh, at least we're in Hawaii. The laws are different. I guess my kids are safer. Maybe there's some denial there that it couldn't happen here. 
Another part of me started to think in the next few days about those families. The families of the 19 kids, the families of the two teachers, and how they never got the chance to say goodbye. They didn't even get a chance to be at a hospital bedside holding their loved one's hand as they passed from this life to the next. It was so fast. They didn't get to have that type of passing or death. Part of me was angry. Part of me was was angry at the shooter. Part of me was angry at American society. Part of me was angry at the politics, the gridlock. Part of me was angry about how I've seen this pattern over and over, and I still don't know what to do, even though I've seen it so many times. I'm mad at myself for not knowing what to do. And to be candid, I have been angry a little bit at God this week. Where are you, Lord, in this? I have lamented. Maybe you have too. But for those of us who have kids, those of us who have nieces, nephews, Hanai, Ohana, extended family, anybody that would call us uncle or auntie, we know for us that we would do whatever it took to protect those kids if we were in a position to do so. We know that we would think of something in our power if we were in that moment when the lives of our loved ones in the next generation are at stake, right? Whether that means teaching our kids to blend in ahead of time to prevent this possibly, the way that Mordecai teaches Esther to kind of blend in, keep a low profile. Or maybe we would be like that church in Orange County, California just two weeks ago that had an active shooter come to a luncheon. It was a Taiwanese church and they swarmed the shooter One person did uh, get shot and suffered a fatal wound, but the rest of the community was able to surround this shooter and just, you know, tie him up with whatever was available, which was an extension cord to kind of tie his legs together until um, the police could come. We would do that. Or would we? I don't know. It's never happened to me. But... This month, there's been a 10-day span in which we've had shootings in Buffalo, shootings in Laguna Woods, California, now Uvalde, Texas. Just in a 10-day span, dozens of lives have been claimed, shattered families, and people are on edge, understandably, around the country. And so, maybe Mordecai is our example of a first step lamenting in the city square, saying, something is different and I will not dress the same. He cries out in a loud voice, where are you, God? Why, O Lord, have you hidden your face from us? Where are you, God? And that's why I'm so glad we did that lament that Pastor Cheryl led earlier. How long, O Lord, in your mercy? For decades, I was reading the statistics of how car accidents for a really long time were the number one cause of deaths for uh, children and youth in the United States. And until very recently, that was the case. But now it's gun violence that's the number one um, killer of youth and children in the United States. And so like Mordecai, what can we do but start with crying out, how long, O Lord? Or think about Ukraine. This, this Russian invasion has caused Europe's fastest growing refugee crisis since World War II. And there's been more than 6.7 million Ukrainians fleeing their country and a third of their population has been displaced. And so like Mordecai, we enter into this practice of lament and say, where are you, Lord? How long will it be? I was also reading some CDC statistics about COVID and how this past week we got to the 1 million mark for deaths in the US because of COVID, over a million people. And globally, the number is somewhere around five and a half million, depending how you count, deaths because of this virus. And so we lament, like Mordecai, we cry out, how long, O Lord? 
And as Esther hears the laments of Mordecai, she starts to revision things, just as you and I might be changed as we listen to the parents in Texas or as we listen to whatever crisis is on your news feed. Will we be open to seeing if it's time for us to be in an Esther moment? And what did Queen Esther do? She realizes her people are, in the face, are, are facing potential ethnic cleansing, genocide. And how does she live with purpose, with that knowledge, with that awareness, with that step her uncle has taken? How does she live with purpose? Well, let's go back to the text in verse 15 of Esther 4. Esther replies to Mordecai, okay, go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa, that's the capital city, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. Notice she says, gather up all the Jews. So she's going to have to say that she's one of them. She's going to lean into her Jewish identity and heritage and this long-standing resource of a practice that they call fasting and prayer in community where they discern what God is saying to them together and what to do. This tradition goes back centuries and now we've, as Christians, inherited that practice as well through Jesus, our Jewish Savior. And so Esther gathers her people and she starts, you know, not talking about policies yet, not figuring out where everybody lands on the spectrum. Not everyone maybe agreed with what Esther's next step should, should be in terms of, you know, using her position policy-wise. But she gathers them first just to be together, to be with her people, to lament, to fast, to recognize that when you fast, right, you sense some hunger because you're missing meals. And that hunger reminds us of our deeper spiritual hunger and how we do not live on bread alone, how we need to be fed by God to be sustained, particularly in times of national crisis. She gathers her people. And so that's number two in your outline, to activate your revisioning process and partner with God's purposes. Ask, who are my people? If you're mixed like me, Hapa and Hotly and Chinese, you might have multiple groups of people, and that's okay. That's actually good to have more groups of people. But who are they? And who are the ones that can provide you with support and strength as we discern God's direction for us together in community? All of you who graduated this week or this, this year have a community that helped you to get here, right? There was a community that helped this book come to be. There's a community that helps Wellspring to be who Wellspring is. We give each other support and strength. And Esther, in that revisioning moment, recognized that's what she needed, that's what her people needed, and it was no longer about whether she would blend in individually or not, but whether as a community... They were just going to wait to see what God would lead them to do after these three days of fasting. And so she leans into that cultural heritage. All of us have a cultural heritage. Every culture, every ethnicity has a gift, at least multiple gifts, I believe, from God. We've been given that as a gift. Whether you're Chinese-American, Scottish-American, Rebecca's Italian-American on her mom's side, so we're trying to do a trip to Italy next year for our 20th anniversary, right, babe? <laughs> Neither of us have ever been to Italy, and of course, it's a great tourist destination. But there's also this aspect of getting in touch with heritage and the beauty and the gifts that run through the bones and blood of Rebecca's mom's family and her family and now our kids too, among all the other ethnicities, right? There's treasure there that we can lean into. And sometimes our first thoughts are, you know, the food or the music or the clothing, but I believe there's also spiritual treasure there too. Kind of like Esther's people with the fasting, with the prayer, with that strength that they drew on together as they leaned into who they are, not just blending in to the dominant culture. And finally, after we assess our resources, our relationships, there might be a time to take a risk. 
And the last point in your outline is to activate your revisioning process and partner with God's purposes. Ask, what am I willing to risk or lose for the sake of others? And that answer will vary from person to person, right? You know, some people will risk their reputation. Other people might risk their finances. Other people might just risk, you know, not having the same um, Saturday afternoon that they normally have. And it's okay to be wherever you are on this journey. It could be that you're at the stage of looking at your resources and your position for the first time in a while and, and saying like Esther, wow, how has my position changed since everybody knew me as Hadassah? Now that I'm Queen Esther, what's different about what's around me? And even if I'm the same little kid on the inside, I'm actually more grown up than I realize. And I have more of a voice than I realize. Or maybe you're at the stage of gathering your people and coming together with those who have a priority that you share. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, on a, on a social issue or something in the news. It could just be something that you share in common because you care about your neighborhood or you care about what happens to your grandma or you care about what happens to a legacy that has been passed on to you. You gather with your people and eventually, at one point or another, I believe we will have to take at least one risk or two in life. But that's Christianity. We follow Jesus, who took a lot of risks. And Esther, as as much as she took a risk, she just points us to Jesus, right? She puts her life on the line and points us to the one who put everything on the line. And for her, she said, if I perish, I perish. She took that risk The king spared her life, and so she didn't perish, and her people were saved. And the rest of the book of Esther is about this amazing victory for for God's people. Jesus did perish. He did go through the cross. He experienced that burial on Holy Saturday before being resurrected. So what about you? What are you called to do? What are you called to do? risk or pray with somebody about risking. I've really been influenced by someone who preaches a lot and writes a lot on the book of Esther. And Brenda Salter McNeil, who you may have heard of, um, she's written a, a relatively new book called Becoming Brave, where she pulls together a lot of wisdom from what she's taught on Esther over the years. And she says, you might not be the queen of Persia, but you do have some type of power some ability to affect change. As we recognize this, it's important for us to come out of the palace and use our access, our influence, our relational networks, and power to combat the lies that inhabit the flourishing of all of God's people. God calls us to come together and discern what that is. We have different perspectives in this room. We vote differently. We think differently. We respond differently to these types of tragedies. And that's okay. I hope we don't all think the same. But I do hope we are unified that we want to come together and think through a kingdom perspective about resources, relationships, and about risk. That is what we share. We might not come to the same conclusions or have the same revisioning process, but we are all on a revisioning process journey, especially in this pandemic where so much has changed. And people are wondering, is this even the right faith tradition for me anymore? That's what I write about in this book. It's been a struggle for me personally. Some answers are not easy to come by. And yet we look to the one who sacrificed it all. We look to the one who was resurrected so that we could be reborn and renewed and all things through Jesus can be renewed even in a time like this amen let's pray
Redeemer Jesus, you are the one that we look to. You are the one in whom we place our hope. And we know that you call us to different things at different times and different seasons of our lives. You call us to different risks and different steps of faith. And Lord, I just ask that wherever we are at this morning, whether it's thinking about resources, thinking about relationships, or thinking about the fact that it might mean losing something to do the right thing for your kingdom, for your purposes. Help us to be a community that supports and strengthens each other through that process, Lord. Help us to catch your vision because it is a time for revision. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask these things. Amen.